Great. Thanks, Nilo. And hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many um, folks here today um, with interest in this project. Um, I uh, just to sort of give you a little bit of a sense for my involvement in the project. I was the project manager for this project. I am not the technical remote sensing GIS expert. Um, I had others in my organization, mostly Chantal Koning, um, who did most of the heavy lifting in terms of the, the technical piece. Um, but a, a lot of what I do is, um, you know, helping develop and, and implement these um, inventories and then, you know, translating that into information and, and knowledge and um, helping organizations try and um, actually take these data sets and use them in a way that that helps um, inform or um, make better decisions on the ground. And so I'm just going to share my screen here and hopefully everyone can see. I can't see you when I go into my presentation. So um, if folks can't see this, maybe you could let me know verbally because I can't actually see anyone in Teams, but I'm going to assume it looks good. Looks great. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so today I'm, you know, I'm here really to give you an overview of the, the work that we did. Um, some of you, you know, there, there's a sounds like there's a range of, of folks um, here in terms of your background and, and how you might be using these data sets. Um, the presentation will be fairly technical because, you know, part of the objective here was to to communicate um, how these data, the methods for, for developing um, these data sets, because a lot of um, how we, the limitations and the appropriate use of these data, data sets is sort of tied to how they were developed. And so we want to be really clear um, in how the, the methods that we use for these data sets. So it will be fairly technical. Um, so hopefully um, people won't be incredibly bored by, by what I have to say. <laughs> But it is really important um, to understand some of the, the technical pieces that go into this. So um, I'm, I'm going to focus really on the, the technical parts, but then, you know, at the end, have a little bit of a conversation about where you might, um, where your organizations might uh, leverage these data sets or use them in terms of, of next steps. So um, Nilo gave a, an overview already of sort of the objectives of this project, but but really, one of the, the main focuses for us um, was to create consistent spatial data um, that can be used by a range of different organizations. So again, the, the folks who introduced themselves on the, the round table really showed the diversity in, in terms of the organizations who may have interest for using these data sets. And so we really were mindful of trying to um, create data that, that could be used by a range of different organizations for a range of different applications. And that includes things like supporting land use planning um, generally, but then really more specifically, the, the primary need that was um, identified was to support um, wetland management. So whether that be wetland monitoring or conservation or restoration initiatives, um, a, a great deal of the work that we did was really focused on wetlands in particular. Um, and so in order to help meet this objective, we created four different spatial data sets. So the first one was a, a current land cover inventory, and we created that land cover inventory because that land cover inventory is actually the input um, for the creation of the second data set, which is uh, a wetland inventory. Uh, the, the third inventory that we created was what we call a restorable wetland inventory. Um, and the fourth, uh, is a historical wetland inventory. So today I'm going to walk you through all of the methods that we use for to develop each of these inventories um, and then outline some of the you know limitations that you need to keep in mind as you use these data sets and you know some of the appropriate uses for these data sets. Um, and then also again I mentioned um, talk a little bit about how your organization might be able to to apply some of these data sets. So just to start out, I want to um, outline what the study area was for this project. So the, the work was really focused on the portion of the Bow River Basin 
outside of the mountain park. So the Bow River Basin on this map is in blue. So you can see that, you know, the, the mountain parks region, Banff National Park, um, was excluded from uh, the study area. Um, and because municipalities were identified as a, a primary end user for uh, many of these data sets, we actually ex expanded the study area from the Bow River Basin to include municipal boundaries for the six rural municipalities that, that are shown here on this map. So, um, so you can see that it's not just the Bow River Basin, but it's the Bow River Basin plus the, the, the boundaries of those counties. And so in total, the study area encompasses um, 35,787 square kilometers. And when you put that into sort of the, the perspective of how much of the, the province, it's about 5% of the province of Alberta. So uh, a fairly uh, large area of coverage. And uh, th this area, as illustrated by this map of natural regions, uh, really is an immensely diverse area. So uh, geologically diverse, climatically diverse, um, and it stretches from the Rocky Mountains and foothills and, and parkland in the western portion of the study area to the grasslands in, in the east. And, you know, the diversity of natural region is, is one sort of big challenge in terms of creating uh, data sets across a, a range, uh, an area with th that kind of range. But the other thing, if you think about this area, there's also a huge amount of diversity in terms of human land use. Um, so, you know, things like forestry activity, lots of recreation, um, agriculture, including both intensive cropping, but also, um, you know, livestock. Um, and we also have major municipalities, including the city of Calgary. So a huge range of, of land uses in the region. So the, you know, the diversity of climate and land cover types and land use types, um, in addition to just the sheer size of the study area, um, you know, I guess was one of the, the, the first challenges uh, that we face in creating um, data for an area like this. Um, so one of the, the, the biggest um, challenges, I guess, in terms of creating data sets over such a large spatial extent is, is that we, you know, the very first step is assembling appropriate data sets that we can use to actually create these inventories in the first place. And we used spot satellite imagery, which was imagery that was provided um, by the government of Alberta. Um, for use in this project and they also um, provided uh, lidar data sets for, for use in in the project um, and this just shows this map just shows you the the various um, image tiles the size of the tiles and the number of tiles imagery tiles that we had to select and sort of piece together in order for us to to create um, the imagery that we could use to classify uh, the study area. Um, and so this just shows um, the, the S6 or S7, that's, that stands for either the SPOT6 satellite or the SPOT7 satellite. And then the numbers behind that are the dates of the, the imagery that we selected. So you can see here that the majority of the tiles that we selected were from um, some some month during the growing season in the year 2020. Um, that was the year that we started this work. And um, because of numerous reasons, we had to uh, supplement some smaller areas with imagery uh, from other dates. Ideally, when you create a land cover classification or a well in inventory, you're able to find imagery from the same year or the same time of year. But there's numbers, numbers of constraints in terms of selecting imagery, including cloud cover, or atmospheric haze, or other issues with the imagery. So, so you are sort of limited um, in terms of what's available. And so the, the objective here is really selecting the best quality of imagery for doing the classifications. Um, sorry, we also, I, I mentioned LIDAR. Um, and the LIDAR data 
uh, again was obtained from the government of Alberta. And you can, uh, th there's different resolutions of LIDAR data. So one meter, seven and a half meter, and then 15 meter LIDAR data products. And for the majority of the study area, so for the study area where there isn't any hatching, um, that that's the area that was covered by the 15 meter LIDAR data product. So the LIDAR 15 product was the primary LIDAR data that we use for the majority of the study area. But you can see from this map that there was sort of a mishmash of other coverages of LIDAR of, of different resolutions. And so we also had to take the, the various LIDAR data products, um, put them together and resample them to a consistent um, spatial resolution in order for us to use those data sets. And then you can see that there is a portion in the western part of the study area where there, there is no LIDAR data available. And so we did have a portion um, where we didn't have LIDAR coverage. And I'll just point that out. That's this, this area uh, in here where we didn't have any um, coverage. So this, uh, I, I just wanted to touch a little bit on image quality because satellite imagery is really, um, the, the spectral information that's available in the satellite imagery is a really important piece of um, the information that we use to create these classifications. <clears throat> and not all satellite imagery is created equal or is ideal for image classification. And I sort of mentioned this earlier, um, it could be because, you know, you have a portion of the study area that's covered by clouds or, or atmospheric haze, which means that you can't actually see below um, to the ground surface. So there's obstructions in the imagery. Um, the other big challenge for us um, is, is that um, a lot of the ideal sort of image acquisition dates uh, are during the growing season because that's when you can see vegetation on the ground. Um, but there's a period of time in the growing season, sort of July period, where um, all vegetation is just really green. And so um, that's, that's not especially helpful for image classification because all of the spectral information that's coming from the ground is just the, the same green signature. And so sometimes we are looking for different, you know, various dates that, that sort of give us a little bit more variation in, in the spectral information coming from the vegetation. But sometimes uh, we can't select those images because of cloud cover or, or other issues. And so again, uh, it can be really difficult for a really large area to find high quality data for the entire study area. And so this is just a map showing our sort of um, assessment of the, the quality of the imagery. So you can see that in the, the western part of the, the study area, the images that we had available to us, we sort of rated as, as poor quality for a number of different reasons, mostly because of cloud cover. Um, and you can also see that some of those poor areas or moderate areas of image quality also overlap the areas where we also had no LIDAR coverage. So these sorts of issues in terms of the quality of your input data really does influence the quality of the outputs. Um, and so we just wanted to recognize that, you know, from the outset, there were, uh, there were some challenges uh, with respect to just the data that were available to us for, for doing these classifications. And this is just a sort of a map that shows the spot scenes. So, so in total, there were 16 different images or scenes that we selected um, from which we created these data products. And you can see just visually how different uh, each of these scenes are from one another. So some of them are darker, some of them are lighter, some of them are greener, some of them are, are sort of browner. And when we when we do an image classification, you you typically take all of these different scenes and, and you can do a correction um, of reflectance and sort of color balance for each of these images so that they look, they're, they're sort of the values, the, the spectral values from each of the scenes are equal. Um, and that's, the, that's a correction that you can do so that you can tile all those images together and then run a classification um, on a single mosaic image. And ideally, that's how you run a classification. But because of issues that are related to how the data, these data get processed before it's purchased by the provincial government. Um, it's, it's actually not possible to 
do that color balance and correction and and tile all of these scenes together into a single mosaic. And so we actually had to run separate classifications, 16 separate classifications on each of these tiles, and then we had to um, merge those classifications together, um, which uh, in terms of um, classification outputs improves the quality of your outputs, but it adds in some challenges just with respect to actually putting those data sets back together along the margins of some of those um, image tiles. So the, the other thing I, I wanted to just touch on that you need to sort of keep in the back of your mind as I talk about these data sets is, is image resolution. So the, the image that you see on the screen here is um, a quarter section uh, scale of the spot satellite imagery that we use to, to run these classifications. And um, spot imagery is six meter resolution. So the smallest resolvable feature in these images are, is six meters by six meters, which if you sort of do the, the math and calculate area, that's that's equivalent to 0 0.036 hectares. And to give, give you a sense for how big of an area that is, that's about the size of a single car garage. So um, we are limited when we use um, satellite imagery of you know a six meter or a 10 meter or a 30 meter resolution you're really limited to um, what you can resolve in terms of the smallest features from that imagery so so in our case um, we are not able to pick out or see in the imagery any features that are smaller than a single pixel so that 0 0.036 hectares so, so from a from a technical perspective, it's just not possible for us to actually identify and map features that are smaller than that minimum resolv resolvable mapping area. So, again, that's something that that you, in terms of limitations, if you're interested in really tiny, super small features, uh, we're not able to map those just because of the constraints in terms of the the type of imagery that we use. So with those sorts of things in mind and in, in terms of the general overview of the, the different data sets that we used as inputs into, into each of these data products, I wanted to walk you through each of the, the four spatial data sets um, and give you a, a really quick overview of the methods and then also results and some of the things to keep in mind as a user of these data sets. And I'm gonna start with the land cover inventory. Um, and some of you may be familiar with you know, the term land cover and what land covers are. But before I go on, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page about what I what I mean when I say land cover. Um, a land cover classification is a map of, of the land surface. Um, and most land cover classifications are a mix of um, land cover and also land use. So when I say land cover, I mean things like trees uh, or shrubs, or grass, that's a land cover type. But land cover classifications also sort of mix into that uh, land uses. So for example, agriculture. So often you'll see land cover classifications that have an agriculture class. Um, agriculture, if you think about it in the strictest term is not actually a cover type, it's a land use type. Um, but within the agricultural land, use, there's a number of different land cover types, you know, wheat, barley, that sort of thing. And because it's sort of m difficult to map all of those things, uh, we often will lump land uses into a single land cover type. So, so it's often a, a mix of cover and land uses. Um, and land cover classifications are typically made um, nowadays, anyway, using machine learning algorithms, algorithms that process a wide range of different data types. So I've, I talked about satellite data, which we like to use for land cover, cover classifications because satellite data has um, a lot of spectral information in it. So it's different than air photographs, which only have three or four bands of information. Satellite imagery has more spectral information. It collects more information than even we can um, perceive with the human eye. And because of that 
increased spectral resolution in the satellite imagery, it actually provides us with really useful information that we can use to run these classifications. So there is a trade off there in terms of using satellite imagery because it may be more coarse, it may have a, a, a lower spatial resolution, but it has a higher spectral resolution, which allows us to run these classifications. Um, and, and I also mentioned the LIDAR data. The LIDAR data we can process into different terrain products and we can merge using these machine um, learning algorithms, merge these data sets together to create predictive models of, of where these different land cover types occur on the landscape. And so that's essentially what's happening when we create a land cover classification. We create a whole bunch of different data, we call data types and, and layers, and we call those layer stacks. And we, we put those layer stacks together and we feed it into uh, a machine learning, learning algorithm and the machine processes all that data and, and basically spits out a, a predictive model based on training data that we give the computer of each of the different land cover classes that we're interested in. And most land cover classifications have multiple levels of, of uh, classes that are nested in a hierarchy. So at the first level, the classes are really broad. Um, and as you move down your classification to higher levels, you get more specific uh, classifications. Um, and so for this uh, bow land cover classification, we really um, specifically and purposefully um, created a land cover classification that that gave us classes that were ideal for us to then take the land cover and use it as an input to create a wetland classification. So this table shows you um, the the level one and the level two uh, classifications in in this data product. So you can see that at the level one. We we're dealing with more with broader categories of cover. So as an example, forest at the level one, but then at the level two classification, we then classify forest into more specific types. So conifer, deciduous and also shrub. So some of the you, you can see from this table, some of the level one classifications are same the level one and the level two are the same because we have not broken down natural grassland into a finer classification level. Um, and what makes this classification different or unique, especially if you sort of compare it to other land cover products that might be out there, um, is that we really did focus on differentiating in, in our land cover classification, the upland and the lowland classes, because these lowland classes uh, were really important for us in order for us to be able to use this to create the wetland inventory. So we do have two at the level one, two different types of lowlands, natural depressions and agricultural depressions. And then within the natural depression, we have very specific land cover types that are associated with, with different um, cover types that we see in wetlands. And the class definition for each of these is, is provided here. There's more detail in the report. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of these, but if you're interested to know exactly how we defined each of these classes, um, that information is in our report. So the take home message really is that when you use these data sets, you can display the land cover either at the level one, if you want a sort of more general map of land cover, or you can also use and display the data at the level two, which gives you a lot more specificity in terms of the type of cover. And this is a, you know, this is a sort of big, complicated looking uh, graphic. This is essentially a, a graphical overview of how we created the land cover. Um, I talked a little bit about how, you know, we have these different types of data that we use to create different spatial data products. So we process the LIDAR data into specifically a probability of depression and a cost distance to water layer. Um, and these data sets we feed into our random, random forest model in addition to the different products that we developed from the satellite imagery. So I talked about the spot imagery and we create a whole bunch of different um, spatial or uh, spectral data products from the spot satellite. But we've also used 
uh, data from Sentinel-2, which is uh, a freely available um, satellite imagery that is a 10 meter pixel resolution. So anyone can access Sentinel-2 data. And Sentinel-2 data is really um, valuable for us because we can create time series um, from that Sentinel data. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about time series later on in the presentation, but understanding not just a single uh, point in time, but the variation in, in cover types across a series of, of uh, dates is something that we find really useful and helpful when we're creating land cover and wetland inventories, which is why we, we access that Sentinel-2 data to create that time series information. All of this data gets stacked together and we feed that into the random forest model in addition to this training data that I mentioned earlier. So training data is essentially, we take the imagery that we wanna run the classifications on and we select points from that data set of known cover types. So we'll you know, select a, a place of open water, for example. And when we select that point, that, that point has all of the information that's tied to a specific land cover class. So all of the spectral information, all of the elevation information, any of the other data that's associated with that specific point then gets assigned to a, a, the class open water as an example. And that training data then gets fed into our model and helps us be able to predict the various land cover types that come out of the random forest model. So once we run this model, we get uh, a land cover uh, product and we do a lot of both semi automated and manual cleanup. So uh, as part of the creation of, of this data set, we spent hundreds of hours um, looking at the output um, from the ran random forest model because you will have um, you know, errors coming out of that model. And so we recognize that no random forest model is perfect. Um, and so we do a lot of manual cleanup. Um, and at the end of the day, we, we have data that we use that we can use to validate our land cover. So the validation of the land cover is essentially how well was our model able to predict each of those land cover types um, from, from our classification. So this is a map um, of the, the level two land cover classes of the study area. Um, and, uh, you know, from this map, you can see probably the, the land cover um, that you see meets your, your expectations in terms of what you know of this area. It's essentially, you know, more forest cover in the west and, and mountainous cover in the western portion of the, the, the study area. And as you move further east, you get more agriculture and more um, natural grassland areas. There's also a lot of, you know, big water bodies and, uh, you know, the big pink blob sort of in the, the west central portion of the study area is the more built up portion of the area where the city of Calgary um, uh, is. If we sort of zoom in a little bit closer, so again, here's the city of Calgary um, for reference. The, the sort of closer we zoom in, you can start to see how the, the resolution of the imagery affects what we're able to classify. So, um, you know, zoomed in, you can sort of see again, um, you know, little subdivision here, uh, some of the, the wetland areas that have been mapped. And if we put the, the image underneath, you can sort of see how our land cover correlates to the features that are, that are underneath that. Um, so again, you know, the interesting thing about land cover is, um, and this part of the reason why, you know, I talk a little bit about minimum mapping units and resolution of the imagery is, is as you zoom in and, and as the spatial resolution of, of the area that you're looking at gets finer and finer, you, you get, you become, you start to see sort of the limitations, uh, of the input data sets in terms of the resolution, pixel resolution. So um, again, that's just something to keep in mind in terms of uh, things as a user that you need to be thinking about as you use these data sets. So, so one of the things that is really important to consider um, 
If you zoom in really close to this land cover data set, because we used a pixel based classification, uh, the, the boundary of a lot of the sort of polygons that you see will be jagged. And, and those jagged edges are because it's you're actually seeing the edges of the pixels that were classified. So in terms of boundary accuracy, pixel based classifications don't give you nice smooth edges. And um, because we we're dealing with a six by six um, unit, um, you know, half of your pixel might fall into, you know, one of two different land cover classes. And so the boundary between two land cover classes might not be precise, uh, exactly precise. And so if you're looking to use this data set, uh, for example, to, you know, put a, a, a precise boundary of a tree stand or a wetland on a map that you want to use for survey purposes, that's not an appropriate use of this data set because the boundary accuracy is, is going to be, um, you know, plus or minus six meters, but probably even coarser than that. So that's something that to, to be really um, mindful of. The other thing is that when we um, sort of the, the final step in creating the land cover, I talk about the, the pixel size of six by six meters. We actually, um, the minimum mapping unit is not a single pixel. And so uh, if you keep those single pixels in, often your land cover classification has a really kind of salt and pepper look to it. And you may have a single pixel that's misclassified in the middle of, of a larger area that is properly classified. And so, um, most land covers select a minimum mapping unit, which means that you have to have um, a certain size of an area for it to remain in the classification. And so for this land cover, our minimum mapping unit is 0 0.022 hectares, which again, for sort of spatial reference is 200 meters squared. So it's a fairly large area. Um, so again, if you're looking for features that are smaller than 200 meters squared, they are not going to show up in the land cover classification. Um, and so we are missing small features in this land cover. The other thing to really keep in mind is despite, you know, despite our best efforts, despite all of the um, data that goes into the classifications, despite all of the time that we spend trying to clean up the errors in the classifications, the reality is, is that some of these classes, land cover classes are really, really hard to differentiate based on just looking at an image alone. So, you know, examples of that are natural grassland versus rough pasture. Um, if you just look at those areas in, an, in a photograph, especially in a satellite imagery with a six meter pixel resolution, it's really, really difficult to differentiate those things from one another oftentimes. So um, there may be, you know, we know that there are errors in terms of um, misclassification of rough pasture, maybe as natural grassland or natural grassland as, as agriculture or, or pasture. Um, and so th those are certainly errors that are in the land cover. The other thing um, are cropland areas versus, I, I sort of mentioned this agricultural depression category that we used. Um, this is a really good um, one for us to think about. Most of you are probably familiar with wetlands that are sort of seasonal or temporary um, that are in the middle of agricultural fields. And oftentimes those areas are, are dry enough to be cultivated. So they still have wetland properties. Um, they may have wetland soils. They, you know, in the springtime may be wet, um, but they dry up four out of five years early enough for the producer to be able to plant and, and uh, get a crop off of them. So from our perspective as folks who make land cover classifications, there's a real question there about do we classify that as a wetland or do we classify it as a cropland because it's actually both. Um, and so we, we, you know, we we intentionally have this agricultural depression class in our classification to try and capture that uncertainty with respect to wetlands, but certainly we get it wrong sometimes. And we have, um, you know, places that we call cropland that maybe were better suited to be classified as agricultural depression and vice versa. So there are specific classes that we know there's confusion. Um, and, um, you know, we really, 
we we know and we report those those classes where there is confusion, but we really want to make sure that for classes that really shouldn't be confused, like open water and forest, for example, um, that we have good differentiation between those classes. So this is all to say that, you know, when you think about these limitations, the known errors, um, issues with boundary accuracy, all of those sorts of things, um, the land cover data is good information, but it should never be re relied upon to make really important decisions in absence of using it in, in conjunction with ground truth, ground truthing. And that's sort of a consistent theme that you'll hear me sort of repeat over and over here. The next one is is the well in inventory, and so um, just to give you an overview um, in terms of how to create a, a well in inventory, some of the things that we're challenged by when we sit down to create a well in inventory is that the class, the size, and location of wetlands is all influenced by climate, geology, and and human activities, and so all of those things combined can make it really challenging for us to decide. You know, this is a wetland of this class, and here's the boundary of, of that wetland. The other thing I mentioned this earlier is that the year and the time of year of the imagery that we use, because climate has such a massive influence on where wetlands are on the landscape, um, that the selection of your imagery can really have an important influence on the outputs. Um, and so, you know, this diversity and the dynamic nature of wetlands in terms of how much water they hold in, you know, between years and within seasons makes them really, really difficult to, to accurately map. And this is just a, a sort of an illustration of, of what I mean. So th this is the same place on the landscape in four different years. And you can see that some of those wetlands look pretty similar. They hold open water. They're pretty consistent through time, but there's a number of other basins that are highly variable. Um, and it's really difficult if you just, if you have only one snapshot in time to, to accurately identify the boundaries of those wetlands. And th this is an example, again, this is high resolution air photographs, but this is the spot imagery um, that we use to classify this area. So again, you can really see how that pixel resolution um, and that single snapshot in time can really um, influence what you're seeing, which is why we, again, we try and capture the variation by using time series data and then <clears throat> also using terrain data to help us identify where those wetlands are. So I've talked about how the land cover is the major input into the, the creation of the wetland inventory. And so basically we take our land cover and we extract the relevant classes. <clears throat> so again, I, I talked a little bit about um, how we designed the land cover classification. And that's specifically because we knew that we wanted to just focus, essentially extract those lowland wetland land cover types as the focus for the creation of our wetland inventory. So that included the open water areas, the natural depression, and anything that was classified as agricultural depression. And this became our sort of preliminary wetland inventory. And from that, we created these objects. So essentially, anything with those land cover types, we dissolved those together and we created a boundary around those. And that was sort of the rough boundary of where we thought the wetland was. And then again, because we know that um, there's errors in, in any classification, we, we did a whole bunch of semi-automated and manual cleanup. And, and that included uh, removing a lot of features that aren't wetlands. So when you map open water, you get lakes, you get streams, you get creeks, you get rivers. Those are not wetlands. We take manually remove or semi in a semi-automated way remove those features because we don't want them in the wetland in inventory. Um, we also recognize that there's been a lot of work in this area already with wetland inventories and some of the inventories uh, were created using higher resolution imagery than the imagery that we were using. And so we didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so we brought those, those inventories in and we made sure that in areas where there was, there was better mapping than what our inventory showed that we included those other inventories in our inventory. So in a lot of ways, this is, this is sort of a merging of the best available information where there was better information about wetlands. 
And it is a final step because we, you know, the, the, the objects that we have at, at this stage have land cover associated with them, but we want to be able to take, go from a land cover to an actual wetland class as per the Alberta wetland classification system. So the, the AWCS, the Alberta wetland classification system has five different wetland classes, shallow open water, marsh, swamp, fen and bog. And we basically had to create a crosswalk between the cover types that we mapped and the type of wetland. And if you look at the Alberta wetland classification system, practitioners who take that um, classification key into the field with them, basically we're using percent covers of different cover types to make a determination between those classes. So as an example, if you are shallow open water wetland, you have more than 25% cover of open water in the deepest portion of your wetland. And so we use those cover um, proportions and types to assign wetland classes based on the land cover characteristics associated with those wetland objects. So ultimately all of the wetlands in our wetland classification have two different sort of pieces of spatial information. The first is the land cover embedded within each of those objects, but then we go from that to assigning a single wetland class. So in this map, you can see that um, all of these objects represent a, a single boundary of, of a wetland and within that we've assigned a single class and in this example we have three different classes of wetlands within um, this particular area. So if you look at the the study area overall um, you know what's interesting and it's hard to see again at this scale but but generally what you can sort of see uh, is that as you move from the west to the east we go from a higher proportion of fens, which are, are, are peat systems, peat dominated wetlands, through to more shallow open water and marsh wetlands in the east, which are which are mineral based wetlands. Um, so there is a sort of gradient in diversity in the types of wetlands that we see. And, and a lot of that is driven by what I talked about earlier, that sort of natural region and the climate conditions really do have a strong effect on the types of wetlands that we see in each of these different areas. So one of the questions that um, I've been asked as we've been developing this inventory is, is how is this wetland, dif wetland inventory different from other inventories that are out there? Um, so there's, you know, the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute has a, a wetland inventory, um, and then there's the provincial merged wetland inventory. And one of the big differences between our inventory and these other inventories is, and I've talked about this already, is that we have taken out non-wetland features. So rivers, dugouts, reservoirs, lakes, those have been removed to the extent that's possible. And, you know, certainly we may have missed a, a dugout here or there, but to the extent that we were able to clean those features up and delete them out of the wetland inventory, we have tried to do that. I also mentioned this, it integrates the best available mapping data from other inventories. So we are hoping that it's, it's the most comprehensive um, inventory that is out there. Um, and then again, the big difference is that we assign those wetland classes to the entire wetland object rather than to the class object. And so just to illustrate that, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. This is the ABMI inventory and this is the provincial uh, merged inventory. And if you both both of the provincial and the ABMI inventory, they preserve the, you know, the shallow open water and the marsh. Um, classifications, even though this is a single wetland and this wetland should be classified on the basis of what proportion of um, open water versus vegetation is in this object. These inventories don't go from that level to the final step of sort of looking at those proportions and assigning a single um, class to a, a wetland object. Whereas our inventory has both of these pieces of information. If you're interested in the land cover type within this shallow open water wetland, you can see those attributes, but we do assign a single wetland class to that single object. The other big difference you can see from this map is the ABMI inventory is based on Sentinel satellite data, which is a 10 meter pixel resolution. And so you can see there 
the minimum mapping unit for the ABMI data set is, is quite a lot coarser. So you can see there are quite a few wetlands that are missing from their, from their inventory. Having said that, you know, our inventory is certainly not, not perfect. Um, our inventory does, you know, one of the things in terms of validation, we look at how good are we are predicting, is it a wetland or is it something else? Is it an upland habitat? And at that level, you wanna make sure that your inventory is really, really good. So our accuracy in terms of, is it a wetland or not? Is, is our, our accuracies are very high. We also then look at our accuracies in terms of being able to accurately map each of those wetland classes. And as you do that, your accuracy levels drop. Um, and, and that's because you have confusion between your different classes. And in particular, our inventory, and if you look at any inventory, well in inventory and the class accuracies that are reported, um, swamps are notoriously difficult <laughs> wetlands to map. So a swamp is a wetland with mineral soils, it's dominated by woody vegetation. And so it's really easily um, mistaken for marshes that have a ring of uh, riparian vegetation that um, sort of gets captured in that object mistakenly or treed fens. Um, and the only way really to differentiate tree treed fens from a swamp is by the soils, peat or mineral soils. And that's not something that really we're able to differentiate from a satellite image. It's really something you need to go into the field and dig a hole and look at the soils. So we know that this classification, um, you know, swamps are misclassified and they're confused with most frequently fens or swamps. And so that is something that as a user, folks need to be, to, to be aware of. So considerations for use, the boundary accuracy is the same, you know, the, the issues I talked about with respect to land cover are also true for the wetland inventory. Our minimum mapping unit for the wetland inventory is 0 0.04 hectares, and, and that's actually the provincial standard. There's a there's a provincial standard for creating wetland inventories, and we've met the minimum mapping unit that's stated in those standards. So this inventory, despite the fact that, that it captures a lot more small wetlands than the ABMI inventory, for example, there are still very, very small wetland features that are missing in this inventory. Um, the, the sort of unique thing about this inventory, and I talked about that cultivated depression category, um, it does include in, we did include those wetlands in our inventory. So most of those cultivated, um, wetlands will be classified as marshes. Um, if you don't want to have those, if you don't want to consider those uh, cultivated wetlands or you want to consider them separately from all of the other marsh types, you can extract those specific wetlands out because we've attributed those wetlands that are cultivated depressions from the natural depressions. And so as a user, you're able to split and differentiate that um, based on the attributes. I talked about the class confusion, so, so that's just something that you really have to be mindful of. And again, um, because of that, you should really be using um, these inventories in conjunction with ground truthing. So the next inventory I want to talk about is the restorable wetland inventory. And um, the objective of this inventory was to identify drained wetlands that have a high likelihood of qualifying for wetland restoration as per Alberta Environment and Protected Areas Wetland Restoration Program. So this includes wetland basins that have a very obvious drainage ditch. That's primarily the, the restoration projects that the government's interested in giving out restoration dollars for are wetlands that have been drained via a surface drainage ditch. And so to create this inventory, we systematically searched across the study area at a scale of one to 10,000. So this was all manual, bums and chair looking at um, imagery. Um, and we identified wetland basins at that scale of one to 10,000 where we could see a really obvious drainage ditch. And we used a, a range of different um, image products. So the ArcGIS um, software that we use has a base map imagery that we use primarily for this, but we also on the side had dual screens and we had access to Google Earth time series images so that we could sort of look at a series of images because again that's really helpful for us to identify 
um, what's happening on the landscape. And then we also had, you know, as a reference, really old um, historical imagery that we would look at. So, you know, it's, it's pretty challenging to do this type of work, especially in an area like the study area where portions of, um, especially in the East, if you think about some of the agricultural practices there, hugely highly modified landscapes where we've basically, you know, excavated massive areas or, or you know, re-engineered the landscape. And so in areas where, that have a lot of um, sort of uh, re-engineering of the landscape, it's really pretty difficult for us to differentiate what's natural versus um, maybe artificial drainage. Um, and, and so that was a, that was a really big challenge. Um, there's also, if you're familiar with, with this landscape, there's also a lot of places where you get, um, you know, ephemeral surface drainage between sort of wetland basins. Um, and a lot of that is natural. And, and in some cases, producers will go and sort of um, tweak the natural drainage. Maybe it's not going and using a backhoe and digging a, a trench to drain the wetland, but they may just enhance the drainage in those natural drainages by sort of pushing dirt around a little bit to just help the water flow. And so differentiating sort of that, that natural drainage from um, assisted drainage can be really difficult in some places. Um, and then, you know, there, there are regions of the study area where tile drainage is used and because the tile drainage is underground, um, that's not possible for us to see. And so there are instances where there's a high likelihood of drainage, but we're not able to actually confirm that on the basis of just looking at air photos. So this is uh, what the restorable wetland inventory uh, looks like. Each of these points is a point on a wetland basin where we um, based on our review thought there was uh, a high likelihood of uh, a drainage ditch being present. So if we sort of zoom in to a particular area, you've sort of seen this imagery already. What I want, really want to highlight here is the difference in these image, images in terms of, you know, these, these surface drainages that you can sort of see. So this, you know, these straight lines connecting basins together that don't look natural. This is really what we're looking for when, we, when we're looking for drainage. And so again, just to show you that spot imagery, to, to show you um, the differences in the high resolution versus um, the, the six meter resolution imagery. But based on our inventory, you know, these are the basins in this particular area that we flagged as being high probability of being drained. Um, and that's what it looks like when it's overlaid with the, the current wetland inventory. So, what, you know, a couple of things to think about when you're looking at these drainage points. Um, we flag basins that are being drained, so water is coming out, but we also flag the basins that are receiving those, the, the water. So, you know, the, the receiving basins, the consolidated basin, from, you know, from a strictly sort of technical perspective is not a drained basin. It's actually receiving the water, but it's been impacted by drainage, which is why we have also flagged those consolidated basins. So in a lot of cases, the consolidated basin um, isn't empty of water, but it may actually hold more water than is typical if you look at sort of historic conditions. So that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. You may have also noticed from the example that I showed that some of the points may or may not have a wetland basin associated with it in that current inventory. And that could be for one of two reasons. Number one, we just, there was an error in the current inventory and, the, and a basin wasn't identified. Or um, we, we saw evidence of drainage, but that drainage basin has been so highly modified that we actually couldn't pick it up in our classification. And so either of those things could be true. The other thing is the, you know, our accuracy in terms of flagging those basins varies. And, you know, this is all manual interpretation. And so um, we may be underestimating impacts. Again, I'd mentioned the tile drainage where, where there is tile drainage and it's common, but we, we can't actually see visible evidence of drainage. Um, and we may have also overestimated drainage in areas that I talked about where there's the naturally occurring ephemeral drainages. 
Um, and we, you know, we may have decided based on our interpretation that we thought there was enhancement of drainage when there may or may not be. So again, um, you, valuable information in this inventory, um, but you know, a point on the map alone should not be um, you know, used as like high confidence in terms of for sure, for sure, there's a drain base in there. It really does need to be used in conjunction with ground truthing. So the final inventory I want to talk about is the historic wetland inventory. Um, and th this one was, you know, going back in time to try and identify where wetlands used to be on the landscape. And to do this, we use black and white ortho photos from the 1950s and 1960s. So it's a mosaic of different um, dates. Um, and we, we use this imagery because it's freely available as a mosaic from the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. Um, but there's some massive challenges working with uh, historical imagery. And um, one of the biggest challenges is that um, the air photo footprint is very small but the ABMI takes these individual air photographs, they geo-reference them, so they, they try and situate them in geographic space, and then they tile all of those individual wetland or individual images together. Um, and when they did that tiling and stitching together of all of those images, they didn't balance um, the, the photographs. And so you, I sort of talked about this in the context of satellite imagery. If you don't balance your your um, the spectral information in your individual photos, then you can't actually compare the values that are the reflectance values from those images. Um, and so if you look at some of these tiles, some of them are really bright, some of them are really dark, and it, it's impossible for us to actually correct for that. And it makes the classification of those images really, really difficult. Um, and this is just an example of that. You can sort of, you can really see from this example where those tiles were sort of stitched together and the, the differences in the reflectance and the digital number values for each of these um, tiles. I talked about, um, you know, taking these photographs and then situating them in, in, in space. Um, and georectification of historical images is actually really difficult because if you don't have a feature in the image that you can sort of tie to a place in the real world today, it's really difficult to get that really accurately placed in space. Um, and what we fi find with this particular data product is there's a lot of warping or stretching of the, the images, and we also have a lot of gaps in between tiles. Um, and so in a lot of cases, the, the spatial referencing of the historic image doesn't match up perfectly with current imagery, there's a spatial offset, and that offset um, creates then an offset in the wetland features that we map in the historical versus the current inventory. So you may have a wetland in the same location, but because the, the two images are not perfectly matched with each other, you get this difference in the location of the wetland boundary. So again, here's an example of a historical image that has that gap between the tiles. So we, we have no information about what's happening in, in that. And then, you know, here's the same um, space or, or place uh, in the spot imagery. And if I sort of flip between these, you can sort of see some of the warping that I'm talking about in terms of um, spatial offsets between these two different images. In terms of the mapping extent, we really found that the, the imagery in the western portion of the province or of the study area was really low quality and just impossibly hard for us to work with. And so unfortunately, we had to exclude the western portion of the study area from, from the historical inventory because we just the, the quality of the mapping outputs that we were getting, we weren't happy with and, and we didn't want to to put put that data out there into the world. So the, the area in green is the area that was included in the historical uh, mapping. So I'm not going to go through this for, for the really technical people in the audience. You know, you can sort of look at this in our report. Um, but this is the, the results of the historical uh, inventory. Um, and if we sort of zoom into a little bit closer, looking at this scene again, 
that's where we um, mapped historical wetlands. And if you overlay that with um, the current inventory, you know, this, this sort of is a place where the spatial offset isn't too bad, but you still see that there is, um, especially in, you know, this region of the, the image where there isn't a perfect alignment between the boundaries of the, the current and the historical wetland. So because of the issues with the, the spatial offsetting and, and some of these other image quality issues, we really caution users against doing a direct comparison. So we really don't think it's appropriate to say X number of hectares was mapped and identified in the current inventory and X number of hectares or numbers of wetlands in the historic and therefore we've lost X number of wetlands and X area of, of wetlands. Um, we, we, we don't think that's an appropriate thing to do, especially at really um, at smaller spatial extents. There's just too much error associated with the historical inventory. But it is a really useful product, I think, if you're interested in like a general reference to identify areas where there's been change in the distribution of wetlands. And when I say distribution, I mean both losses of wetlands, but also gains of wetlands. So it's really interesting if you sort of go through the historic inventory, there's lots of areas, and this is sort of related to the consolidation of basins that I talked about. Lots of areas where we're draining, you know, massively huge areas down into a single wetland that historically was quite small and now is, is a massively huge wetland. So we're seeing both losses and gains from the historic um, condition in terms of where wetlands are and how big they are on the landscape. So moving forward, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. I think some of the discussion today might also touch on some of these issues, but just to sort of get um, get your minds racing, especially for the, the planners in the room, there's a lot of opportunities to use all four of these spatial data sets. So, you know, from, a, from the perspective of having a benchmark going forward to understand change on the landscape in terms of you know, wetland cover, but then also covers of different natural habitats from the land cover. You can use the land cover inventory and the wetland inventory as a basis going forward to understand, you know, where and how much change is happening over time. These data sets, especially the land cover and the wetland inventory, you know, at, at a landscape level should be really useful products for, um, for land use planning or, you know, inter-municipal inter development plans. Um, there's some municipalities who may be interested in doing natural asset inventories. Again, these data sets would be really useful and helpful in, in doing that kind of um, planning. The land cover and the wetland inventory also would be really useful for habitat assessments or habitat monitoring or habitat modeling. So one example could be doing a connectivity analysis if you're interested in, you know, um, connectivity of wetlands or connectivity of natural spaces on the landscape. These these data sets would be really good inputs into that kind of analysis. The wetland inventories, the restorable, the current and the historic inventory is also really good for identifying opportunities for wetland restoration and or enhancement opportunities on the ground. And then all of these products in some way, you know, if you're interested in watershed level planning or modeling, so identification of flood risks or, or um, you know, looking at risk to infrastructure or those sorts of things, any of these data products would be good inputs into watershed level um, modeling or, or, or something similar. So I've sort of gone over my time. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think now uh, generally open to questions and uh, discussion for, for those who might have questions. Great, thanks so much, Sherry. Uh, 